and thanks for watching this Life Solved Short. I'm Robin Montague and in these videos we get to meet the University of Portsmouth researchers sharing their work in the latest series of Life Solved podcast. This is work that's changing our world for the better in all sorts of ways. This time I'm with Dr Faye Cathedro to hear how her research in mapping ocean health and pollution is linked to an endurance rowing event. We'll be finding out about the people who took this challenge on and about the incredible data that's been gathered to help us understand and protect our oceans and biodiversity in the fight against climate change. So Faye, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. First, let's start from the beginning. Tell me about your research and how you got into this particular field. What drew you to it? When I was younger, deciding what degrees to do and things like that, uh, I really enjoyed the marine environment. I love being outside and I love the water. So I did a degree in marine biology. Uh, however, once I did the degree, I realised actually marine biology probably wasn't quite where I wanted to be. Uh, the focus was very much on the animals and maybe behaviour. And I was more interested in a sort of a more holistic view, looking at the chemistry and why the uh, animals behaved the way they did related to what was happening in their environment. So I moved into biogeochemistry, which is biology, geology and chemistry all combined. Um, and it's how they interact with each other. And I found that that was much more my niche, that, 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 that felt much more comfortable to me. So I began working in that field and I moved from marine waters to estuarine waters to fresh waters to sewage because that's where the pollution is. Um, but, you know, what's coming off the, the land in terms of road runoff or, or sewage release or industrial releases. And um, then I got the opportunity with this to do a little bit more marine work again, which I was really, really keen to do. You've managed to um, work on this event, this rowing event, and almost give it a, a more of a purpose beyond just sporting. So yes, it was it was uh, the the people who organised the row, GB Row. Um, they they came to the University of Portsmouth because they thought that they could do something more while they were doing it. Like rowing two thousand miles isn't enough. <laughs> they decided that they wanted to do something even bigger than just that, and they spoke to us about what they could possibly collect, what data they could collect that would be useful to us. And so we had a chat with them. We looked at the boats. That was a really big thing. We can't just collect anything. These boats have to go all the way around the UK, probably around 30 days often, without touching shore. They can't bring on any more batteries. They can't bring on um, any more water. So we had to be really clear about what was feasible for them to collect. And we came up with microplastics, uh, environmental DNA, and underwater sound. For anyone who uh, isn't in the field and isn't really familiar with the term microplastics, what does that mean? Is it something that we can see in the water or is it so small that, and it's just everywhere basically? So it's a little bit of both. Uh, unfortunately, you're right, they are everywhere. So the ones that we can't see are in the air, they're, they're in the air in here in this room um, and they're in the sea. Uh, so we need to use microscopic techniques to look for those. But they also, they go all the way up to five millimetres. So at five millimetres, you can see them. And unfortunately, these are often in the size range of feeding for, for a lot of fish. So they are all the way through, all the different size regions are having a negative impact on our marine environment. And that's why you guys decided that this was something that was really important to be able to collect data on across the coasts. Yes, yeah, so um, normally you need a large boat and you need these huge nets that you put out and you trawl you know, the water behind the boat. So you get a lot of water through the nets, but by necessity, that means the holes in the nets are quite big because they'd break otherwise. So they tend to look at things above 0.3 millimetres, which is, which is great. We're still getting lots of data from that, but they're obviously very, very expensive to go out on a big ship and do this. These guys were rowing. So we weren't paying them anything to do this, which was very, very, very good. It was very kind of them to, to collect the data. But we designed an actual new pump system so that they could pump the water while they were rowing uh, and collect much smaller plastics so we can see a, a bigger range uh, from what we would normally see. And you said it can't affect how they perform. It has to be very clever in the way that it functions with the boat itself. So just walk us through how you came to that development. How did you design this function really so they were keen on the plastics angle so they came to me and said well how do you measure them and I said I put out a big <laughs> this big net and they're like well that's not going to work obviously the drag of something like that is not going to fit in a race environment which is why we developed the pump but there were other things such as the hydrophone 
where it was going to sit within the boat. So this is for the underwater noise. Um, so it's actually at the moment part of the rudder. And there was a lot of work that went into how we could protect the hydrophone, but without having something sticking out that was going to affect the, the ability of the boat to perform well as a, as a race. Did you work collaboratively with any other departments here at the University of Portsmouth on the project? So I'm in the Department of Civil Engineering and Surveying because it's more about the solutions that, that I work in, in in pollution. But I worked with the Marine Biology Department and also with the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation. How did that come about? <laughs> so uh, I was already working with the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation for other projects. And whilst I was working with them, um, I was speaking to Andy Lundgren and he mentioned that what he does as an astrophysicist is look at noise. So he looks at space and they have these huge data sets where they're looking for very small variations in sound to make them understand, well, the universe. So I said, well, could you do that in the sea for me? <laughs> and um, yeah, he said, yes, he, he didn't see why not. We, we got some trial data and he immediately found some dolphin sounds, uh, looked at the harmonics and, and, and the, the, the sort of sa soundscape that was there. And I said, could you do that if we got a soundscape for the entirety of the UK coastline? And that's what they're working on at the moment with us. Have you had any um, initial feelers of what the sea sounds like around the UK coastline? Um, yeah, unsurprisingly, uh, when they left from uh, London, they left from Tower Bridge in London. So it's pretty noisy along the Thames Estuary, as you would expect. Um, and it's it's really uncomfortable, actually, to listen to the sound. So if you put some headphones on rather than just listening to it, you know, through a mobile device or something, you put some headphones on, you really start to feel how uncomfortable it must be for the, the animals living in the sea, that constant noise. And it's at a very low um, frequency, which, which sort of almost resonates. It feels uncomfortable to listen to. And in terms of going back to the microplastic side of things, how successful was the journey? Because it was, it was about 2,000 miles, wasn't it? So that's, that's quite a lot of um, sea to, to map. And did you find the results really promising? So the microplastic data is uh, um, going to be coming out soon and we found that we are getting more uh, microplastics per metre cubed of, of seawater than some of the previous studies, but that's because of that size difference. Um, as I mentioned with the nets, they use the 0.3 millimetre, that's the, that's the smallest they can go. We're looking at 0.04 millimetres. So we're seeing a bigger um, range of sizes and therefore we're getting more microplastics. Uh, and we're looking at the moment, as we might have expected, around sort of city areas, there, there appear to be more. But uh, I'm waiting for some of the more, what we would consider pristine water data to come in. And that's quite a shocking thing, isn't it? When you think of the size of that and how much is in the water, um, how has this evolved then over the last, you know, 10 years, 20 years, or even since, you know, since our lifetimes? How has that changed in the water, do you think? So a lot of it is difficult to unravel because it depends on the techniques. So 10 years ago, we wouldn't have been able to look at some of the really small particles that we can now. And the methods that we use to detect them have, have really evolved. So it's quite difficult to, to say, but... Plastic doesn't degrade. That is the problem with it. It sticks around for a long time. Instead, it's breaking up into these microplastics. And because of that, um, it can be inferred that the numbers are going up because we are producing more plastic and therefore more is getting in and none of it is, is degrading away yet. So my worry is um, as we get better at detecting them, we are seeing more and more and more. Um, and what that means for our health going forward, the ocean and our own, uh, is is quite a concern. And like you said, there is a concern because it's not just the fish that are being affected by the microplastics in the water. This also comes back to us just because of how we, I suppose, use the ocean. Yeah, um, obviously from food, there's been quite a bit of literature about food um, around uh, the sea, the, the fish in the sea and it coming back to us. Uh, on our dinner plates uh, but I'd like to point out to those people who go oh well we don't eat fish so it's fine um, unfortunately the number of microplastics uh, that are not in the sea is huge as well there, there are actually more microplastics probably in our soils and in our air than there are in our sea so, so if you're worried about what's in the sea you sh should also be worried about what's in the air and in the soil 
So yes, it can get back from the marine environment to us, but the way it's getting into the marine environment is from us on land and we're also breathing it in and eating it from other areas as well. Thanks so much, Faye. That was absolutely fascinating and really looking forward to find out more about the data and uh, to hear more about the other projects coming up over the course of the next few years. If you'd like to find out more about the project, listen to the full episode of Life Solved on the University of Portsmouth website or your favourite podcast app now. You can click the link in the comments box below or head to port.ac.uk forward slash research and you can find out more about the GB Row Challenge at gbrowchallenge.com. See you again next time.